Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public and I welcome you to our second lecture at the Belmont Library this spring. And before we introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to thank Joanna Breen at the uh, Belmont Library for hosting this lecture series, setting it up for us and her great help uh, with these events. Tonight, the subject is the dark age of the universe and our speaker is Dr. Lincoln Greenhill. See your research fellow at the Department of Astronomy, Harvard University, and radio astronomer at the Smithsonian Astrophysical uh, Observatory. Dr. Greenhill received his PhD in astronomy from Harvard in 1990, and he then served as a postdoctoral fellow at the Miller Institute for Basic Research in Science, and as a University of California uh, Berkeley senior research fellow, and then as a radio astronomy back here at the Smithsonian Astrophysical uh, uh, Observatory. In 2007, he joined the Harvard Department of Astronomy and uh, as a senior research fellow. And he has, since that time, has combined an amazing number of tasks, including as a lecturer in the astronomy department, as a project uh, scientist at the Murchison Wild, Wide Field Array in Australia, and visiting professor at the Miller Institute for basic research in science at Berkeley. And what he will focus on tonight, the uh, long wave array, and I'll let him explain that to you. Dr. Greenhill's focus in astronomy is on the dark age of the universe, a very exotic little era, uh, and that is his topic tonight and on related phenomena, including, I think, the period called the reionization and on supermassive black holes and star formation, all of this sort of uh, coming together. He actually does more than all of this, but we'll keep it brief so that we can have plenty of time to hear him and to see the wonderful equipment he has brought with him tonight, including this antenna. It is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Lincoln Greenhill. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak, uh, to speak here. So um, the talk will be in the center. In real time on a feed from New Mexico, provided the Wi-Fi holds out, we're going to have uh, running on the left side, normally I, I don't do this uh, because it's distracting, but running on the left side, these are real time images of the sky in New Mexico, the radio sky. and that the radio sky is dominated not by things like the sun and stars. It's, in this case, it's dominated by, um, well, you can see off to the left where it says Ver A. That's a supermassive black hole in the galaxy called M87. But for radio astronomers, it's called Virgo A. And you can also see the galactic plane. And occasionally, the display looks like that, which is man-made interference, which is coming into the antennas. And these are the types of antennas that we're using. So I'll refer back to that. But um, this is a real-time image of the sky. Every instant, it covers horizon to horizon. So that's something that we, we can't do with optical telescopes readily. It's something that is particular to radio. So let me, let me go back to the, 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 the main bit. And I'll also coordinate with, with some of the props that, that I've brought with me. And now, hopefully, I will. That's good as a start. Um, so this is a, a wonderful illustration from Scientific American um, circa 2006. And it's essentially showing a history of time. Um, today is here. This is, uh, as you'll see, this, this is the modern universe. It's full of galaxies. It's dark in between the galaxies. And this is the Big Bang. And then we have a bunch of blank pages. And um, the notion here. Uh, that we're communicating is there's a lot that we don't know during a critical early period in the universe of about a billion years 
We have lots of theory that tells us how the first galaxies formed, the first stars, when they formed, but we haven't been able to look back far enough to actually say with certainty which theories are right, which theories are wrong. We're just beginning to get the first, you know, census of you know, maybe only tens of galaxies, maybe 100 galaxies, which are in this opening chapter. So what I'll be discussing, and, and uh, as Yvonne mentioned, the long wavelength array, and I'll bring in uh, the name of the project that I work on, we're attempting to find new ways to collect data that will take us back that far. And that's good. So the important thing is that galaxies that we see today pictured at the bottom are not the galaxy are not what those galaxies looked like at the beginning of the universe say of order 13 billion years ago and this is along the lines of a, uh, a backward progression of how galaxies appeared so they're large they're lustrous they're you know largely um, they're largely uh, comprised of stars spiral galaxies uh, the stars organized into spiral arms for this type of galaxy they're also elliptical galaxies which are just blobs of stars but then as, as you go back in time they get smaller the amount of gas in the galaxy doesn't necessarily change but the number of stars that have formed up to that point becomes smaller and smaller so that's why over here you see the galaxies are much smaller. They're also redder, and that's actually because, as uh, we, we refer to that in astronomy's redshift, as you go further back in time or to greater distance, then the light is shifted to the red. So this is actually just a, 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 a useful trick and, and reminder. So still, the universe is almost 14 billion years old. We're only halfway back. And so the question is, well, what do things look like if you go even further back? And this is a beautiful picture taken with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope that shows a cluster of galaxies that um, you may be able to make out apart from the bright spots. You know, here is a galaxy seen face on. You can probably make out the, uh, the dust. Here's a galaxy that is, uh, that is edge on. Um, and this is in the foreground. This is maybe about five billion years old. That is five, if you go back in time about five billion years, you, or to that equivalent distance, you come up to this cluster. And then behind it is what's shown off on the left. These, these are images um, of something that was even further back, something that was at about 13.2 billion years. So it almost at just a few percent of the age. And it's <coughs> not, not terribly, uh, it, it's not terribly large, which is the important thing. Large meaning it's probably a few tens of times smaller than our own galaxy, or it's a few tens of times smaller than a galaxy in the modern era. So things were smaller, there had been less, there had been fewer stars, galaxies were smaller, there were, the, ga the gas just had not yet formed into, in, into stars. So the universe back then, so this is about the limit of what we can see at this point um, using optical telescopes that are available to us now, whether it's Hubble, things on the ground. Um, once we try to go beyond this to say the first percent or less than a percent of the age of the universe, we're, we're stuck. We, we just don't have the tools right now to, to do that. So there, I'm going in the wrong direction. So let me now use a cartoon to tell you what we think based on theory occurred during that, that period of time. So today is on the right and you can see the, the artist conception of dark skies with get peppered with galaxies. The Big Bang being an amorphous blob of energy on, on, on the left. And so we're at 14 giga years. This is about 10 giga years, uh, just using a ruler. So at about 1 billion years after the formation, af after the Big Bang, the universe changed abruptly. And let's, let me walk back. What I did in the previous slide was I walked back across this right-hand third to a period when the galaxies were looking noticeably different. You know, they were smaller, they were less, less developed. But then once you go beyond that, this is terra incognita. And what this is intending to show now, starting from the left, after the Big Bang, um, there were no stars. Um, the universe was just a sea of hydrogen and helium gas. That is to say there was an intensely hot plasma after the Big Bang. Things cooled down and matter formed, that is ne neutral gas formed, hydrogen and helium. But again, there were, oh, this is going to be my undoing, um, but there were no stars by definition. Over time, gravity drew the gas together 
eventually stars formed. And what you have here now, say, in the center are what looks like soap bubbles. And that's uh, trying to indicate that the stars formed, they began to form in pockets, and there was intense ultraviolet radiation which destroyed the hydrogen around. And so the universe goes from being a solid brick of cheese to being Swiss cheese to being increasingly Swiss cheese until eventually all of the neutral gas has been destroyed by ultraviolet or collected into galaxies as they are uh, leaving this adolescent stage early on. And then at a certain point, again, all of that medium, all of the cheese is eaten away and you end up with something that looks rather familiar. So just uh, going to no stars, only hydrogen and helium to small pockets of stars, possibly what we have optical images of are, uh, in that previous slide, to real galaxies, that is, things that would have, say, spiral arms and, and lots of stars, but still adolescent to today's modern galaxies. So the question, though, is what if there are no stars? How do we study this time period at the beginning? And the, the answer is, I think, the shortest one I could possibly manufacture. It's just the, just the letter H for hydrogen. Look at the hydrogen. Don't try to look for bright spots. Just look for all that diffuse stuff that is around. So by studying this diffuse material, specifically measuring its temperature, we can learn something about what's going on in the universe. Cold gas would mean that there's, there are no stars to heat it, for example. So what are some of the important uh, questions? When did those first stars form? And were they like the sun? Were they like any of the most massive stars that we have in our galaxy, or were they completely different? We, we think that they would be, that they were completely different. Black holes and stellar remnants. Stars, massive stars explode toward the ends of their lives, and they give birth to, among other things, black holes. So that means the early universe began to build up a, a quote unquote supply of black holes. But, um, we know that in the centers of galaxies, we have supermassive black holes that could be a billion solar masses or more, and yet a star that's exploding might give you a black hole of 10, 100, we, we don't know. So how do you get from 10 or 100 to a billion? There must have been some sort of merger process. We don't understand that. But we do know that we see the evidence of supermassive black holes at the end of this billion years. So how is it you can build something in a billion years which is that enormous? especially since you have to start from scratch. And then the last issue is somewhat exotic. That is, are black holes, are supernova, are stars the only ways that you can heat gas, or was there evidence of something else? So if we look at hydrogen, if we use it as a thermometer, if we look back to the beginning of time, so to speak, and we find out that the gas is hotter than theory tells us it should be, we need an explanation, and that's, that's what this question is angling on. So, I'm a radio astronomer, and the angle that I have when I don't necessarily have stars to, to look for is going to be study the gas, as I said, use its temperature, which is one of the easier things that one might detect, though by no means terribly easy, and then test hypotheses. So, um, so hydrogen thermometer, uh, I'll use that as a, a term for, for this talk, and this plot shows um, the Big Bang is now on the right, it was on the left, and this is going to jump from left to right depending upon where I stole the figures from, I apologize. But uh, again, this is a, um, a plot that shows temperature on the y-axis and redshift on the x-axis. Redshift is not necessarily easy to calibrate quantitatively um, outside of astronomy, so that's why I simply say today, now is here, the Big Bang is here. And you can see the temperature drops as you go from then to now. So it's dropping because the universe was gradually expanding. This is just a, this is at the same time as radiation, which would be the cosmic microwave background or the cosmic background radiation left over from the Big Bang. As the universe expanded, it cooled off. The equivalent temperature of that radiation cooled off. And at the same time, the gas in the universe cooled off, but the physics is that they cool off at different rates. So that means that there are two temperature reservoirs in the early universe, and the hydrogen gas, you would think, is just cooling off at this temperature, but uh, at this rate. But what I'm referring there to when I say that, it's the kinetic temperature. It's, you know, the 
atoms banging against one another, for instance, or how fast the atoms are moving, you know, a hot air, uh, a room full of hot air um, is full of, uh, has, a, has a speed of uh, oxygen and nitrogen molecules that is much faster than if you, say, had that same room in Antarctica. So this is all a matter of the kinetic temperature of the gas, but that's not the only way to measure temperature, as I'll, I'll show some examples in the coming slides. And it's those other measures of temperature where we're not just banging, where we're not just interested in how fast the atoms are, but we're moving, but we're interested in, for instance, what the electrons are doing. Um, they have a temperature as well. So at, after the Big Bang, just to summarize, there was something called global recombination. That's when the plasma, which is left over from the Big Bang, collapsed, it cooled enough, I shouldn't say collapsed, that the electrons and the protons found each other. They made hydrogen or the nuclei of helium found their electrons and made helium gas. That, that was referred to as recombination. That occurred just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. What happened between then and a billion years after the Big Bang? Well, theoretically, the universe coasted for a lot of that time, as I was saying, until finally gravity uh, drove things to collapse and form stars, and at that point, everything changed. The, it, it was not a universe regulated by just coasting. It was a universe that suddenly had all of this input of energy and explosions and things like that, as I'll, I'll show an example in this computer simulation. So I just want to point out, this is 0.8 billion years. So this is more or less this thread and fabric of places where stars have formed and are beginning to form galaxies. Um, it's moving a little quickly, so I'm going to accelerate. What, you, what you're seeing is in the blue and uh, is dark matter. And I'll return to dark matter later because of the speed of this. But what you can see are these clusters of material are gradually getting larger and larger because gravity is pulling material together to form early galaxies. So, for instance, where it's pink in the middle, that's actually a place where there's something very massive. And now you see green and red, and you can see flashing, for instance, here, and explosions. This is, these are the byproducts of galaxy formation. Stars form, remnants form, black holes form, supernovae, and you start to drive material out of these early galaxies. So what so basically, this is a demonstration that we go from a very passive universe to something that is quite extraordinary and extravagant, to, uh, to quote a colleague's uh, book's title. So here, again, we have explosions are coming about because there are supermassive black holes in the centers, and they are impulsively throwing material out. And what we have in the end is going to be our much more quiescent universe. At about, in a, about this time, we had the peak in the history of the universe of activity from these objects like uh, supermassive black holes. And from that point on, we have a fairly diffuse medium, which is surrounding, uh, which is part of these galaxy clusters. We have material that is connecting galaxy clusters. You saw these wisps early on. Anyway, now this is a simulation. So we take the physics we know, and uh, colleagues in the illustrious collaboration uh, have generated our best understanding of how those mechanisms come together to give us what we see. But the problem is that early on, we don't have, an, we, we, we don't have data. We're extrapolating theory back, and we're making our, our best guesses and coming up with hypotheses which need to be tested. So again, this is, this is today in the context of we have clusters of galaxies, all these bright spots, but that came from an earlier era when the galaxies were forming and things were, uh, the first uh, supermassive black holes in those regions were puffing out enormous amounts of, of material at relativistic speeds. And before that, we're extrapolating into what we refer to as um, the dark age. So sensing temperature, I had mentioned before, well, you can look at kinetic temperature as, you know, I'm, I'm feeling the, because I'm wearing this jacket, I, it, it's warm in the room, that's because of things banging into one another. But there are also, and so that's shown, for instance, here, if I have a source of light that's generating a spectrum, um, and then I put something cold in front of it, and this is made of, I'll use as a, a gimmick, hydrogen. Hydrogen has a characteristic frequency 
for or frequencies for lines, I mean for some of the electron transitions. So when it's cold, it paints a dark line on that spectrum. The light goes through it, it's, it's absorbed. Take away the light source, and instead, perhaps the warmth of that cloud is enough to excite that single frequency, which would be characteristic of hydrogen. Hydrogen actually has many frequencies, but, but for this example, I use just one. So another way to, to assess temperature is just to look at whether there are excited electrons. So I'll, I'll simplify this in the context of previously, I showed a spectrum. And I, shown, I took a light source, sent it through a cloud, and most of, most of the light just passed through. There was no problem. But occasionally, you hit light, you get light at a certain frequency, and it hits an electron, which I'll, I'll say loosely, it, it, it hits a resonant frequency, and the electron is, it absorbs the energy. That's how we got the dark line, for instance. Um, but equally well, if I have an electron which is an in an excited state and I don't have any light source behind it, it may just drop back. The blue state might become the red state, and it would emit light, which is as we have here. So energy conditions in the atom, the a temperature is something that is, um, a temperature is, is what you would use to characterize, for instance, well, how many of these atoms are in this excited state? How many are in this unexcited resting state. So let me go further. So I mentioned things banging into one another. Well, it's not just um, like billiard balls. It can also be as this atom hits this atom, it can actually have other effects. It can knock off electrons, leaving one bare atom. It could, you could send an electron hurtling at high speed, a very hot electron in to an atom. Same thing would happen. Um, so this is another form of, or this is another ramification of, of temperature. Um, and the, ultimately, I'm building to this notion that what we're looking for is not just the, what, what we're not just looking at the kinetic temperature. We're looking at a specific temperature of hydrogen, one of the several, which um, is something that we can measure with, uh, as radio astronomers, since we you know, don't have a spectrum um, with a light source that we are uh, shining through it. So what we're looking at is, if this is just a simplified hydrogen atom, we have a proton, we have an electron, and electrons have spin. They carry angular momentum with them. Sometimes that spin's aligned with the spin of the proton, or sometimes it's anti-aligned. And the amount of energy is different depending upon which, which state you're in. So when the electron flips from being aligned to anti-aligned, it gives off a little bit of radiation. That's the thing that we're going to detect, which means what we're able to study is, um, uh, what we're going to be sensing is the temperature, which we call the spin temperature, how many atoms, essentially how many atoms have two things that are aligned versus two that are anti-aligned. And we understand that as uh, that these other processes, as atoms are banging into one another or as radiation is passing through and interacting, that changes the populations that are aligned and, and the populations that are anti-aligned. So we're not looking at, say, the temperature of the universe, which at the time may have been 100 degrees on the Kelvin scale, um, or you know, minus, minus almost 200 degrees on, uh, Celsius. What we're looking for is a very particular type of temperature, but nonetheless something that we can calculate, nothing that we could ever feel as, as people. So, this is familiar. I've, I've now flipped it backwards. Uh, so the beginning of time is off to the left, and today is off to the right. And what I have in, in the middle is this wiggly line. So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to ignore the fact that this is on a slope and just try to level it out so I can display it nicely left to right. And what I have here, this wiggly line, is this alternate measure of temperature, which is just how many atoms are like this and how many are like this. And early on, the temperature you see begins to fall. And that corresponds to all of these hydrogen atoms are um, losing temperature because the universe is gradually expanding. And the, ma the, the matter is cooling at, at, at its own rate. Um, at a certain point, though, the banging together of atoms just takes too long. That is, the universe becomes so rarefied that this hydrogen atom and this hydrogen atom just never meet. And at that point, um, this temperature no longer reflects the kinetic banging temperature 
the, uh, of, uh, of, of the gas, and it just begins to, to drift. It actually comes into an equilibrium with the radiation temperature. I, I will not, not explain that in detail at the moment. It's just a matter, though, to remember there are two reservoirs of temperature in the universe. The temperature, the spin temperature, will be on one or the other. When the collisions become so rare, you can't keep this temperature synced with the kinetic temperature. It just drifts off to the temperature of the radiation. However, then something happens at about this point, uh, which is about 100 million years after the Big Bang. And this corresponds to when the first stars form, or this occurs because of light from those first stars. So this is labeled the Dark Age. The, the, the universe is expanding. It, uh, the hydrogen gas cools in temperature. Eventually, that temperature, with the kinetic temperature and the spin temperature, are no longer the same. Radio astronomers, because we're just looking at the, this one particular transition, which is created uh, where the radiation is created when electrons go from this alignment to this alignment, we are specifically looking for, we are specifically studying when this transition is a measurement of temperature that corresponds to either the banging around of atoms or the background radiation. So it's going to vary and all over the place to say, and some, and there are some events that occur when, uh, some events occur that change it radically. This is one of them when the first stars form. This is another when those stars form in such great numbers that the, uh, the Swiss cheese begins to be more air than, than cheese. So um, I'd like to focus on uh, what, what we've been doing. We have an experiment called the Large Aperture Experiment to Detect the Dark Age, which is a rather um, uh, strained acronym since we had to drop two words in order to make it work. Um, however, uh, we, have, we have a couple websites, so 21 centimeter cosmology, or more usefully maybe cosmicdarkage.org. Um, so our experiment is uh, sited in California with another uh, location in New Mexico, and that's why over here we're beaming pictures from New Mexico. Our colleagues at the uh, Long Wavelength Array Project um, are observing actively with, with other science programs, and this is coming live from them. So let me now uh, zoom in. This is on the Nevada border. Uh, it's just uh, somewhat south of Lake Tahoe on par with San Francisco. And there's a long valley here that leads off the Mojave Desert, uh, which is down here. So I'll be zooming in on that, that location. And the uh, closest town is Big Pine. Uh, Mount Whitney is in this vicinity, so the uh, highest mountain in the uh, contiguous 48. And now I'm, this uh, says Zurich, I don't know if you can read it, uh, in the uh, early 20th century there was actually a railroad running in this area and that was referred to as Zurich Station that Google thinks that Zurich is still there, I find pretty amazing. Um, I think it died in the 1940s. In any case, I'm focused on, on this. Here's the Owens River, um, which uh, is one of the sources of water for Los Angeles. And now I get to something that begins to look like Nazca lines or crop circles. Um, so this is, a, it is an arid, very desert-like uh, environment despite the river. And what you can see here is the ground disturbance uh, that was uh, created when we built, when we and our colleagues at Caltech, for whom this is, this is the property, um, started building a second long wavelength array station that is a sister to this one. And you can see a circle in the middle, and then you can see some lines that go to a few antennas that are off, uh, off, to, off to the side. And here we have some rather traditional radio antennas. They look like just circles, but these are like, they look like giant tracking dish, satellite tracking dishes, but used for radio astronomy. So, now going, going in a bit further, you can begin to see, well, you can see what the brush looks like, these black spots. And then in here you start to see perhaps uh, these very, very light white bumps. Those are antennas like this one. And now using uh, the marvel of Google uh, put into, in, into perspective, again, here is our circle. We have a few straight lines that go off to antennas that are at some distance, but the important thing is we, in this area, we have 500 antennas. So we have 500 of these 
uh, set up running in parallel and we use that to make images of the sky. As I mentioned originally, our friends at the Long Wavelength Array um, are using their sets of roughly 500 antennas to make horizon to horizon images um, of the sky. And so here we have the sun, we have the galactic plane, we now have RFI, we have uh, Virgo A there. So the important thing is at, this, at the Caltech uh, Owens Valley Observatory, we use supercomputing there is a supercomputer and a small CTainer uh, off uh, in the middle um, to combine the signals from all 500 antennas to make images of the sky. And also, we're using that to look back into the dark age, that is, to try to measure the temperature of hydrogen. So let me uh, zoom in further. You can see the replica of what's off to the side. And uh, this is now looking north. We have two parallel lines of mountains. One reason this is a fantastic site is that you have mountains that rise 10,000 feet off the valley floor, up to 10,000 feet, and it blocks the radio, the TV from, uh, from the coast, and from Las Vegas, and from Reno, and it's in that sense, this is a, an outstanding uh, location. The uh, supercomputer lives inside this. The most impressive thing about this picture, I believe, is one of the world's largest, or sorry, the largest air conditioner for many tens of miles. Um, uh, it is, you probably could make snow in there. Um, so some of those antennas, as I pointed out, they're peripheral. So we tr the antennas where we want to make very accurate measurements, accuracies of a part in a million maybe, we try to keep those antennas away from everything else. So this antenna wouldn't be terribly useful right now because it's near metal, it's near people. It, it, well, apart from being near digital television, it's something that is going, you know, it interacts with its environment. So, uh, so we try to keep some number of antennas very isolated except for, for, for uh, some pressure treated, con uh, pr sorry, pressure treated timbers. And you can see that these are you know, what the scale is in terms of the brush, which comes up to maybe, um, maybe knee, knee height. So um, what we do is we have 10 of those antennas. We attempt to measure the temperature of the hydrogen in the early universe, and we're doing it. One of the reasons we need isolation from the coast is we're doing it at the same frequencies where you would find radio, aeronautical beacons, old, uh, television in the original lower VHF band, um, and then we uh, attempt to also take uh, spectra that we calibrate. So we make spectra of the sky, we make spectra of a calibrator, we subtract them, and we come up with, ultimately, the goal is to then come up with that spectrum of the hydrogen signals from, uh, from the dark age. So in order to do this, we have to make images of the sky, we have to measure the ionosphere, and I uh, bring up the ionosphere specifically. If, if you think back to uh, stories about geomagnetic storms, when the sun is very active, um, communications is, is disrupted. A lot of that is because the ionosphere, which is, which is normally relatively placid, it's just a, a you could think of it as a sheet um, overhead, it begins to get ripples and it has waves of, that are traveling through the plasma, which interferes with smooth uh, transmission of radio. It might start reflecting radiation that it doesn't normally reflect, and um, things become very difficult for radio astronomers in these conditions because a source which you know is always going to be there at 9 p.m. suddenly starts drifting around, and that is because the ionosphere is, is acting up. But the ionosphere is everywhere, and the ionosphere here may be behaving differently from here due to proximity to, say, the sun or an event relating to a solar burst. And so your sky becomes a rubbery sheet in some sense, and we need to calibrate that out. If we were observing at frequencies, uh, the normal frequencies, so you know, quote unquote normal frequencies of, say, cell phones or maybe um, radar, navigational radar for cars, this wouldn't happen. The ionosphere is transparent. But at these very low frequencies, and this is one reason the radio astronomers don't normally work at these frequencies, we're intensely sensitive to this sort of wobbly ionosphere that distorts the sky. So uh, again, we, we need to actually make images of the sky so we can figure out what the ionosphere is doing so that we can ultimately then undistort the data which we're trying to collect from, uh, from the dark age. So 
Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, uh, except to note that what we're trying to measure is extremely faint. By calibrating the data, we go from, we, we gain about a factor of 50, which is nice, but not if you need to gain a factor of a million, but it, it, it's a start. And um, this, I better get started. Okay, so now this is similar to that. This is now an image which is created uh, processing data from our supercomputer, our colleagues at, at Caltech, uh, Greg Hallinan and, and Stephen Burke, um, have built the machinery to actually make the image uh, using the supercomputer data. So you can see the galactic center, uh, sorry, the galactic plane is rotating overhead. Here are two very bright uh, sources. One is a supernova remnant. You can see this thing moving off, just setting now. That actually was a sun. And if, and I think this is gonna come back around, um, I think it's, it's a couple days. Um, and what, what you'll see is that um, all the sources, the bright sources, are basically the same intensity. But then the sun comes up and it starts bursting. And that's an example of why, for instance, we don't want to observe during the day. This movie is made during the day. In any case, the important thing or the, the impressive thing is, again, this is a horizon-to-horizon -horizon image of the sky. That is to say, 10 seconds of data, you process it and out pops something that you would not be able to do readily with an optical telescope. You also get an interesting uh, feature here. I'll, I'll play it up in the next slide. But while this is the galactic plane, there's something that comes off the galactic plane that we, we don't see when we, we look in the summer sky. So on the left, we have a halting image, again, from the radio. And this is a fisheye lens looking uh, at the optical sky. So here's that thing which I just pointed out. It comes off the galactic plane, but there's nothing there. Here's the galactic plane, or the Milky Way. Um, well, the sun just came up. Um, but in any case, this is an example of the radio sky. Is not, it, it can be very different from the optical sky. So the stuff that we have to look through in order to get outside our galaxy and to begin trying to sense this dark age signal that we can see through, uh, see because we're studying the temperature of hydrogen at, at very early times, is, um, you know, it's, not, it, it's, not a, it, it's not a normal sky from, from a regular person's standpoint. So I'm going to close with um, just, this is the second to last slide. And uh, note, for instance, on the left, this is a spectra, a very simplified spectrum. So we have a prediction from theory. The prediction is we will see this, we will see a trough. And early on I said, well, there are events that change this temperature of hydrogen. One of them is the formation of the first stars. And so this is that trough for a couple different scenarios. I'm sorry, the lowest curve is yellow, so it probably doesn't show up. But we go from yellow to muddy yellow to a, a pinkish red. And this is what we are supposed to see. And uh, Danny Price, who's, who uh, is in the audience, who uh, is a postdoctoral fellow working with me, um, has made calculations of how accurately, with these error bars here, how accurately we can make a measurement in, I think it's 100 hours. So um, these error bars are small. We should be able to trace this extremely well. But thus far, we've only gotten to about 1 1,000th, one one and we have about another factor of 100 to go. And this is some recent data, uh, and you can see it doesn't look as good as this because we don't yet have the sensitivity we need, but that's something that we hope that we'll be able to overcome in, in the next year. Um, the one thing I like about this plot specifically is that these troughs occur at a frequency of about 65 megahertz, and there is a trough here at about 65 megahertz, but it's not statistically important, but it's very nice because it makes me think of what I wish could be there. Um, so. I just want to end with this. Uh, going back, it's our book with blank pages. The arrow is an indication of more or less where we're looking when we're trying to study the dark age. And over time, for instance, with the Murchison Wide Field Array, which, which Yvonne mentioned, and with the Long Wavelength Array and the LIDA experiment that we're doing now, we hope that, project, that our projects and projects like them will be able to fill in this entirety, and we will not have this blank in the cosmological record during this period when all the important stuff happened. You know, the first metals were generated by the first supernova, without which that wouldn't be here. 
um, and uh, as well the period of time when you know the first galaxies and, uh, formed as well, without which we probably would not have anything like the familiar universe we have now. So thank you. <laughs> so the big thing. Okay, so yes, it, so the um, the problem that we have when we have 500 antennas like that um, is that you have a lot of cabling, you have a lot of signals that you get in, have to get into a very compact space that you can funnel it in for computer processing. So this is one of the receiver boards that was uh, designed by the long wavelength array folks in New Mexico, which we have had replicated for the station in California. And it has 16 signal paths Essentially, you can see that there's more or less this collinearity in the layout. So the signals come in from here. They are then distributed across the board. The signals flow up, and then they flow out on this side. And this is really just an enormous amplifier, which is generating tens of thousands in terms of gain. That is, the signal is amplified by tens of thousands of times. And it has to be such, an uh, such a large board so that you can fit in a reasonably small space without breaking the bank um, all of those signal paths. So you could just imagine you know, um, bringing 500 uh, coaxial cables into one space. It, I don't have the uh, slide loaded up, but it makes for a lot of very uh, uh, modern art in terms of the photography. That is, again, it's a matter of covering a wall full of connectors. The cables come in on one side, then they depart the other, then you might reduce the number by a factor of four, then you might reduce it by another factor created by the fact that you have 16 all in one place, and then you go on and on until you can fit it into the processing equipment, the computer processing equipment, without having to bring to bear on that computer 500 cables. So in, in this particular case, um, I think we have uh, 100, and in California we have uh, 128 cables that are coming in to the computer, but every individual, into the computer is plural, but every individual computer only has, uh, well, I'm, I'm having a, I'm, uh, uh, Danny, I'm, I'm having a senior moment, I'm sorry. Um, each of the roaches takes uh, 32, but it's eight cables, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So. Um, but again, uh, this has a level of gain that, you, that, that is absurdly high simply because the signals uh, need to, because the signals are intrinsically weak. If we had a satellite tracking dish, uh, you know, something like a high frequency radio antenna, it's a parabolic reflector, it has a huge amount of collecting area concentrating all of the energy to a point. A TV, the, effectively, a TV antenna is something with very low efficiency. And that's one reason that we need uh, 500 of them or hundreds or in the future with other projects, thousands, in order to build up enough collecting area to have the sensitivity uh, for whatever the, um, you know, for, for the phenomenon. In some cases it could be exoplanets, in our case it's cosmology. Does the amplifier chain need to be super cooled for large reasons? Ah, no. Um, so at higher frequencies, cell phone, radar type frequencies, many, many gigahertz frequencies, yes, you, you would want to uh, use cryogenics to, to cool that because it reduces the contribution of the receiver to the overall signal. So the sky at high frequencies, gigahertz and above, is basically dark except for bright spots. The, the, the bright spot might be um, something that's created by a star, it could be signals from a black hole, from a jet of material coming off a black hole, but largely the, the space around it is dark. At these low frequencies, we have uh, actually the galaxy, that is the Milky, Way gal the, the Milky Way or the galactic plane, is not just a little narrow band on the sky. It actually, and it's not well shown there where, where you also see the Milky Way. It's actually uh, just a, a, a wide ribbon with all sorts of spurs. I pointed out one of the spurs, spurs and wisps that are coming off of it. And all of that gas is, in t or all of that is intensely hot, it's intensely bright. And so what we end up with is a situation where the receiver noise is unimportant. Even if uh, 
I might be a little flip when I say it. If I set that on fire, my receiver noise would still be low compared to what I have in the sky. So what we, we refer to that as being sky noise dominated instead of receiver noise dominated. Once you're not receiver noise dominated, you can actually use fairly cheap components, uh, which is good because we have to replicate them so many times because we need so many antennas to build a collecting area. So we have no cryogenics and therefore many fewer moving parts. Uh, yes? Yes. Can you talk about the granularity of that model? Like how, how far down are you modeling? So uh, I'm not, I, I did not do that. It, it's part of a, uh, a large collaboration of, of theorists. Um, well, theorists and, and people familiar with, with data. But anyway, different group. So I, I don't know the details. Um, however, if you go to illustrious-project.org, you will come across it. But it's a very good question in that you can't make the computer infinitely powerful, which is what you would need to, sim to simulate everything from the size of many clusters of galaxies, which would be, you know, to simulate something that might be a billion light years across, all the way down to what might be the size of, I don't know, um, a cloud out of which a solar system would form. So can't do that. At a certain point, it does truncate, and they say, okay, there is physics going on at this and smaller scales, but we can approximate it in the following way and come up with something which is a reasonable, uh, a reasonable replication of what we know happens when we're able to study, say, how stars form in, in great detail. So there are tricks that you can play. For instance, you can do the calculation on a grid of points. The grid is very coarse. And then you say, ah, there's something interesting going on here. A star is forming. And then you start making a very fine grid at that point. And then you discover, oh, OK, that's not one star. It's 10 stars. And then you go to a number of even finer grids. But you're saving space is time or computing time each time e with each, uh, each cha transition from coarse to fine to very fine to very fine because you have a lot of space, theoretically, where you don't have to apply that very fine grid. So if you had 10 stars, it's all the space in between those 10 stars that enables you to economize. So the actual granularity of that simulation, I, I don't know. It's the uh, biggest, I believe it is the biggest simulation that has ever been done. Um, and so it is, uh, it has, it's basically a gold mine of information that we can uh, study in terms of finding out, so what's going on here and why does this look that way and things like that. So, um, but on the other hand, it is a simulation. It's based on our current understanding of physics. And so you just can't push it back necessarily with certain accuracy. And so um, that's why for the dark age, we're desperate to get data so that we can actually start testing hypotheses, figuring out which models to throw away, which models to embrace ultimately to improve the accuracy of simulations like that. Thanks. Yes? Um, one of the, f one of the, and the this may sound uh, overly simplistic. Um, one of the great things about astronomy, cosmology, is the opportunity to train and inspire students. And those students don't go on to do necessarily astronomy or cosmology. They go on to work in mathematics, physics, engineering, computer science, many other fields, which they may not have actually, which they, you know, in a different universe, a parallel universe, they may not have actually been attracted to had they not, you know, received that initial, you know, I guess, spark of fascination and curiosity brought to them because they would be studying something and while looking up in the night sky. Now, as I said, that might be overly simplistic. There are also direct economic benefits. That is to say, what we are, just to take our experiment as an example, I'd mentioned we have a supercomputer. It's sitting in the middle of effectively a desert in a shipping container. In order to build that, we took commercial products and we used them in very unusual ways. Uh, so commercial products are graphics processing units you know, for, used for computer gaming. However, People had not previously used those to process 
uh, to do signal processing in real time. Probably the military did, but um, outside we, uh, people had not done it. So the radio astronomers needed to come up with a very efficient way to combine signals from this many antennas over you know, 20, times as many of, uh, 20 times as many antennas as had previously been done. If it's 20 times, it's actually 400 times harder. You need some cheap way. So we, we take from, from uh, the commercial industry what we can, and what we end up with is actually something in one specific case. It's a computer code, an algorithm, that is so well characterized because it has to process those signals like clockwork. It's so well, it's so well understood that it actually enables the company that makes those processing units it enables them to run benchmarks and to study, oh, what kind of features should we have? Why is this compiler for our computer, uh, for, for our codes, not actually working in this case? And so there's discovery there. It's basically, a lot of times you're pushing the envelope. If I were an optical astronomer, I would talk about, well, CCDs came to optical astronomy from the military or from other applications. and our sensitivity requirements were much, much higher. And so we started picking and choosing. Uh, that is, we would pick CCDs that had just particular characteristics. It might have been a one in a batch of 100 that was particularly good. And what you end up with is um, the development then that is done in this different field in astronomy, pushing developments that might have commercial applications. But, and I could have gone to um, magnetic resonance imaging Ultimately, the mathematics that was developed for how we combine these signals and magnetic resonance imaging, they're combined. There, was, there were intellectual exchanges. I mean, ideas flowed back and forth between these two communities. And obviously, MRI is something of um, benefit that if you talk to a radio astronomer in 19, I don't know, 50, they would not have necessarily guessed. So it is tough, but there are direct links. I don't remember the citation, but there is actually a book that uh, I was referred to, I haven't studied it, in which there's a discussion about um, you know, what those commercial benefits have been for, uh, for some particular elements of radio astronomy. So anyway, I, I, could, find, I could find out. Yeah, Come back. Right, right. Can you sort of insert into sort of where the elements came from? Ah. So, so first, I have to apologize because when an astronomer talks about metal, anything that is more than helium is considered metal. So <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's pretty sad. I just happen to have aluminum that I could point to. But actually, you know, the carbon and oxygen is, is also considered a metal. So um, the... Uh, but having uh, move, move that, uh, out of that definition out of the way, it comes from the centers of stars. So stars will synthesize uh, elements up to iron, and uh, every time it makes something that is a little bit further along in the periodic table with nuclei that are a little heavier, it will generate extra energy. That is, that is the fusion process that goes into pushing two things together to make elements. Um, liberates more energy, than, and that is more energy than you have when those things are separate, and that's why stars burn. Um, at a certain point, you get to iron, and then that's the dead end. Uh, you can't generate more energy, want to make things that are heavier than iron, and so actually stars then build up cores within, uh, very massive stars will build up cores that have carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, et cetera, et cetera, up to iron, and then you have a dead cinder, which is in the center of the stars. Ultimately, because that cinder just becomes dead weight, literally, um, the star tries to compensate, not, not anthropomorphizing stars, but it tries to compensate by burning the gas it can burn elsewhere. Ultimately, that fails. It just can't support itself, and everything collapses with an explosion. That's a supernova which sends much of the material that was created, these metals, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, out into the cosmos in a sort of cycle. That is to say, a cycle because it will form clouds. Ultimately, those clouds too will collapse at some later point. And 
maybe that's the star that comes from that will explode and you recycle this material. So that's why people say, you know, we are made of, well, sorry, that's why Carl Sagan's comment was we are made of star stuff because we only exist because of explosion, e exploding stars. And the stars that I was referring to from, you know, the very first stars, they may have only had lives of uh, a few million years uh, before they blew up. Um, but they spread their, they spread that, uh, the metals that they generated throughout the cosmos and then other stars formed out of that polluted gas and then they polluted the gas more. So that was, that, that, that was the origin of my comment on metals. Yes, Yvonne. Uh, that was a, that, 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 that is a really good question. Um, black holes come from stars with one exception, which has not been demonstrated. So let me go to the exception because it has a cool name. So primordial black holes. The concept is that, um, that those actually came from the, uh, the period before the dark age and they would not necessarily be massive. In fact, they might just evaporate um, over time. I won't go into an evaporation, you know, why, why black holes can evaporate. But so there's a special case. They, they're called primordial black holes. We, we have not ever observed them. They're just a theoretical construct. Um, the black holes I was referring to are all the byproducts of uh, stellar evolution. So stars have to come first. And very massive stars create supernovae. Supernovae create black holes. And then, the ish, and then the question as I raised it is, how do you get from something that might be a lot of 10 solar mass black holes to something that might be a million solar mass black hole, such as we find in lightweight galaxies, or a billion solar mass black holes, such as we find in Virgo A, which is just on the left side of, of that display. So the crushing force of the explosion in the, in, in the supernova um, and the collapse of material under the force of gravity for that stellar core is what creates a black hole. And then I wouldn't say it wanders around, but ultimately it will encounter other black holes. And the theory is that then you have mergers, black holes combine, more black holes combine, heavyweight black holes combine to make heavier weight black holes. And it's perhaps a tree structure which ultimately gets you to say a billion solar mass black hole. And we know that those exist a billion years after the Big Bang. That is at the end of the Swiss cheese phase of the universe, you had some small number of billion solar mass black holes that we know now. There, were, there are probably more that we just have not uh, detected yet. But that there are any is rather um, remarkable. That is, how, you know, do you have to have 10 million events where you were merging things together to get a billion solar mass black hole? And it, does that mean it had to happen every thousand years, every hundred thousand years? At what rate? So we don't understand yet why there can be such heavyweights so early in the universe. But everything ultimately came from stars. And in fact, it was, it's those remnants those black holes or neutron stars or other things that actually played a key, um, uh, generated a lot of the X-ray emission that, ha that was necessary to reheat the universe, but I won't, won't go into that. So they are not just some sort of, um, I guess, uh, population genetics experiment. How do I make this thing out of this, you know, a lot of little, uh, a lot of little contributors? How do I get to this? these genetics at the end with a bunch of billion, uh, uh, the genetics of the billion solar mass black holes. The black holes on the way are actually changing the nature of the gas around them. They're raising the temperature and that changes, uh, for instance, how readily stars can, can form out of collapsing clouds of gas. So it, they, they change everything. Um, it's not just a question of populations. Yeah? I'm not sure exactly how to phrase this, but so what technology would you yearn for that doesn't exist or that you can think of? Oh, that I yearn for? Oh, would, a warp would, drive. Would accelerate, <laughs> accelerate the, uh, you know, the discovery process. Or well, warp drive would do it. Um, 
Uh, so let's see, technology that would... One of, the, um, one of the most difficult challenges that we have in using instruments like this and in conceiving larger ones uh, for a reasonable price point is, uh, is the computing. Not just, I'd like the technology, part of that is I'd like the technology to build a computer that is power efficient and a hundred times or a thousand times larger than the one that we have in that uh, shipping container. It's also a matter of um, the, I, and I'll classify this as technology, having the algorithms, the, uh, that is having the algorithms, the equations that are cast into computer code that will operate efficiently enough that whatever the calculation I, I need to do, if I had say 10,000 of these antennas, I would like to be able to process that data efficiently. The real-time computing that I referred to using graphics processing units um, is, pro is a solved problem. That is, we think we know, uh, after having gone through this project and some other projects are doing the same, uh, we, we know how to do that. But what comes next is how you make the images. And so you're essentially you're taking the output from one supercomputer and you're putting it into a different supercomputer. We don't know how to do that calculation efficiently yet. We, it's, it's almost as if we have lots of building blocks and no one has actually come up with the building blocks that you would want to stitch together and try to do something for less than 10 megawatts or I make up that number, but I, the, the amount of power can be enormous. There's a project called the uh, project in development in, in the real world outside this room called the Square Kilometer Array. It's an international project. One of the goals is to build a huge array of antennas, not an array of huge antennas. And the, uh, one of the great problems is how do you build such a large facility without requiring its own power plant? Or some people would say without creating your own nuclear power plant. But um, it's really just a matter of we, we need high efficiency computing. We need enormous amounts of it because the better the algorithm, the better the images. And those images are nice, but those images were done on just a few computer servers uh, running in real time. Our, uh, the images that, were, that I showed in the movies here were also done with a relatively small number of, of computers. But if I want to make a better image, I probably need to iterate a bit. That is to say, to clean out the errors in calibration. And if I start iterating, I can iterate 10 times and get a great image. If I iterate a thousand times, maybe I get a really good image and I can see things that I couldn't before. So the radio astronomers frequently just drive it forward eventually saying, no, no, I need bigger computers, I need better algorithms, or we have this great algorithm, but computationally it's incredibly expensive and I couldn't afford the computer to do that. But at some point, um, actually you will be able to. And so one of the tricks that when we learned how to combine the signals from this many large number of antennas. One of our tricks was just sort of stay slightly behind the curve. Industry was then able to generate things that enabled us to do enough processing in a small space for a low enough power budget. And then, as I mentioned, you know, we were then able to start pushing in different directions and feeding back information in, into industry. So I don't know if I want to really say that I'm yearning for computers. But I prefer warp drive because then we can just go there and look. I, I would much prefer having warp drive because then I can actually go to the places rather than observe them remotely. Um, and in science fiction movies, that always works best. Yeah, fantastic questions. Thank you.